Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at a truss problem that involves using the method of joints to solve it. If you haven't seen my video on method of joints, feel free to look at the top if you need a review. But this problem is interesting because we're looking at zero force members as well and trying to figure out how to identify them to make our lives easier when we're analyzing structures with a lot of joints and a lot of members. Okay, so our problem goes, determine the force in each member of the Pratt truss and state if members are in tension or compression. Now, obviously, when you first look at this, you see a million different joints and a million different members. So you don't really know how to start with this problem. Well, the first thing we can do is look for zero force members to make our lives easier. And a zero force member is basically a member that has no internal forces, creating no tension or compression within that member. All right. So. I have kind of like a cheat sheet here that you guys can use in order to figure out if we're working with a zero force member or not. And we have two points here related to a joint that has two members connected to it. We have one point here that's related to a joint with three members connected. And we're going to discuss if we have a joint that has four members or more connected to them. Okay. So now let's imagine we have our uh, joint here and we have two members that are collinear which means they are parallel with each other and they act on the same line of action, all right? So the first rule is we have zero force members if the, if the members are collinear with no external forces or reactions. So if there's no external force applied at this joint and there's no reactions produced within these members, obviously these members are going to be identified as zero. But why is that? It's to keep this joint in equilibrium, right? So if we imagine that we had a compressive force in these members, the other member would have to act opposite uh, in order to counteract, you know, the force created by the other. That's just simple equilibrium. But if there is no force in one member and no external force applied here, that means that both members are going to be zero. Similarly, we have the same rule, but with non-collinear members as well. So if we imagined, you know, the peak of a truss, let's say, and we had two members kind of looking as so, there is no way that these members can have any forces in them because there is no force being applied here. And if we had a, uh, let's say, a compressive force in this member, a compressive force in this member will not keep this point in equilibrium anyways. So we can quickly identify that if there's no external force here, we know that these members are going to be zero as well if there's no way to dissipate that reaction. Now for three members, it gets a little bit interesting because we could have two collinear members, let's say, and one non-collinear member with no external forces or reactions again. All right. So let's imagine that we have, uh, you know, compressive forces again in these two collinear members, and we have no reaction here. What does that mean for this member? This member must be zero, because if we have no external force applied here, then there's no reason for this member to receive any of the loading from these other two collinear members. But let's say we imagine, you know, we had a force down like this, then the member would have an internal force in the opposite direction. But in this case, we can quickly identify from this rule that this third member that's not collinear is going to be a zero force member. Now, I mentioned here that we need to visualize the flow of forces. So we'll get into that soon, but we know we have reactions that are produced at these pins and rollers, right? So we understand that a force will be transmitted through this member here and work its way up through other members kind of collinearly, right? As we mentioned, joints similar to this are going to have equal and opposite forces as you transfer away to the next member. Also, if we're analyzing a joint with four members connected to it, it is much simpler to just avoid checking for zero force members altogether and just simply do a free body diagram just to see. So let's hop into the problem and see if we can actually find these zero force members using our rules here. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is look for joints with two members connected. Um, but outside of, you know, the pin and the roller, we could see that these are the only two members uh, or only two joints that have two members connected. And since there's a reaction here, we know that these members are going to have forces inside of them. Okay. Now we can look at our joints with three members connected to it. 
and we can look at B first. We notice we have two collinear members and one member that is non-collinear with no external forces applied to this member, right? So that means this is going to be a zero force member at the end of the day. So what I like to do when I determine that we have a zero force member, I like to erase it and see how this changes the problem. So if this was no longer part of our uh, truss, then we notice that we're actually creating a new joint that has three members connected to it. And when we look at this joint, we have a very similar situation as what we have with B. Two collinear and one non-collinear with no external force applied to that joint. So we know that we can actually remove this member as well and identify it as a zero force member. Another cool thing about this problem is that we can quickly identify that, you know, we have a symmetrical structure. What does that mean? That means, for example, member KC is going to have the exact same force member uh, of IE. You know, they're both going to have the same internal force produced. So now that we know this, we can actually update our problem, solve for what we need to solve for, and actually figure out, you know, what each of our member forces are. Okay, now we can actually start solving this problem. I've updated our problem to show that we have eliminated our zero force members on both sides. And for the sake of time, I'm only going to analyze the left side of this problem, but you know, AL is going to equal GH, HI is going to equal LK and vice versa. So you don't really need to solve this other side, right? But if you need to fill it out for a final answer, go ahead and do that, okay? I've also added that there are reactions here at the pin and the roller that are going to equal 20 kilonewtons. But how did I get that without writing down any work? How am I so smart? Well, I actually understand that this problem is symmetrical, right? So we know that the 20 plus the 10 plus the 10 is going to equal 40 kilonewtons. And these two reactions are going to have to evenly distribute that load in the opposite direction. So we have 20 here, 20 here, because 40 divided by 2 is 20. At the top as well, I've also added that FBL, FLC, and somebody on the other side are going to be zero because we identified them as zero force members. Okay. Um, so let's get into this problem and see how we can actually solve uh, each joint. For the sake of time, I drew some free body diagrams, one for A and one for joint C, and we can actually get into solving. So first thing we're going to do is solve for Fy, because we only have one Fy component to solve for as of right now, okay? So Fy is equal to zero, and we know that we are going to be left with a 20 kilonewton force going upwards, so that is positive, and then Fal is going to have the sine of 45 to get that y component for this force. How did I get this 45? Two meters from A to L and two meters from A to B, the vertical distance and the horizontal distance, or the rise over run, this will be used in our tan inverse formula to get that angle, okay? Solving for FAL, we are going to be left with 28.28 kilonewtons. And this force is actually pushing. And we remember our convention, we have compression, right? So now we can solve for F at X, which is equal to zero. We only have one component, which is going to be the FAL in the negative direction. So we have negative FAL, which we solved for to be 28.28. But I'll keep it in the notation for now. And we're taking the cos because we are taking the adjacent which would be the X component for this diagonal force. And then we also have the FAB. And you notice that I actually drew it on this diagram wrong. Why is that? Because when we actually solve for FAB, we're going to be left with a negative answer, which is 20 kilonewtons. Since this is negative, we actually know that this should be in the opposite direction. But what does that mean? That means that FAB is actually in tension because we are pulling at that joint. So tension. Next, we can take a look at our joints here and here, B and L. And we have solved for AL, which is 28.28 kilonewtons. And we know at this joint, we need equilibrium here. So LK has to be equal to this force and BC has to be equal to this force. 
So based on the rules of equilibrium of our collinear members, we know that FBC is going to equal 20 kilonewtons in tension and FLK is going to equal 28.28 kilonewtons in compression. Now, it may seem like I'm running out of space and I won't be able to solve this last joint, but this one's actually pretty simple because now we have FBC. So if FBC is 20, right, like we solved for going in this direction, that means FCD is also going to be 20 in tension. What about FKC? Well, the only Y component or Y force acting at this joint is 10 kilonewtons, the external force. So that means FKL has to counteract that and will create an internal force of 10 kilonewtons in tension. All right, so now we can move on to the final members of the problem. Uh, just to clear up, when I said FKL uh, a little bit before, I meant to say FKC. So FKC is going to equal 10 kilonewtons in tension. Okay, so I've set up this free body diagram at joint K so that we can analyze these members that we don't know, KD and KJ. And you notice that we're going to have two Y components and two X components. So we're actually going to have to solve a system of equations in order to get to that final answer for these two members, okay? Just to explain first, I got 45 degrees here because of the Z pattern. We knew that we had 45 degrees acting along LK prior. So we know that by Z pattern, it's gonna equal 45 over here as well. And because they're collinear. Also 63.43 degrees is coming from our X axis here. And we have a two meter distance going from K to that J member, JD member. And then we have a four meter distance downwards going to D to that x-axis, right? So you can imagine that the angle is acting right here, okay? So now we have to solve the system of equations. I'm going to speed this part of the video up, but if you guys have any questions about it, just leave it in the comments and I'll be sure to reply back to you. Okay, so you should be left with something like this. You can even see inside of uh, my system of equations when I was solving, I actually came up to the wrong answer or the wrong direction assumed for FKD. So I can just make a quick adjustment to that arrow to suggest that FKD is actually in compression, okay? If you need any help with it, once again, just please leave a comment and I'll let you know, okay? So finally, we're looking at joint J to get this final FJD that we already know because we solved for FKJ right here to be 23.57. And we know that FJI is going to mirror this internal force based on the symmetry of the structure. We can actually solve using summation of forces at Y for this force equal to zero. And we need to know what are the angles. We have 45 degrees once again, based on the collinear principle that we had before, right? So we have two of these forces acting upwards, right? So we're taking two of these components, which are 23.57 kilonewtons, and we're taking the sine, because we're taking the opposite, which is going to be that upwards component of this triangle, right? Sine 45. And we just have the negative FJD here. Solving for FJD, we have solved this drawn out problem, and we know FJD is going to be 33.3 kilonewtons intention. Why? Because it's pulling away from that joint. So there's an answer there. There is an answer here. There's an answer here. And we have all of our previous answers here, which are to be represented on the opposite side of the structure as well. Um, just relabeling what each of the, you know, subscripts are for the, the forces, right? All right. That's the end of the problem. I know it was a long one, but I hope it helped. Uh, there was a lot to go over and I wanted you guys to really understand zero force members. So if it helped, please let me know and thank you for watching.